My name is Kathleen De La Hunt, and it's an absolute honor to be talking to you this afternoon about leaders and leadership training. I just would love to share some thoughts with you and some ideas with you and some scripture with you that I feel would be relevant for you to know as young leaders being prepared for the things of God. And I just want to say to you, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 1, this is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a good thing. What you are desiring and what you are being equipped for is a good thing. And so I just want to encourage you with an absolute love of the Lord to be able to start from the beginning and do it well and be excited about what God is preparing for you. I'd love to start with some prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the amazing people that have put time aside to study more about your word, to study more about you, and to have an incredible heart's desire to flow powerfully in the things of the Spirit, to follow Jesus with carrying their cross and following Jesus and being so in love with our Father God. And I want to thank you for people that have a different spirit. You always look for people with a different spirit. And I thank you, Father, that you found them in these men and women that are watching me today. Well, friends, I want to start by just saying that um, as I share with you what leadership and leadership training is all about, I want to start by saying that leadership, and this is a definition I found, and I think it's a good one, is, an organ is organizing a group of people to reach a common goal. That is what leadership is, organizing a group of people to reach a common goal. God delights when his people desire the gifts that he has given them, when they desire the work of leadership, and when they desire spiritual gifts, according to 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. And friends, right from the outset, I want to tell you that leadership is not a position of fame, it's not a position of glory, and it's definitely not a position of power. It is a position of serving, working, and laying down yourself so that others can flourish and others can move into the fullness of what God's called them to be. I've uh, called this teaching, True Leaders Don't Create Followers, They Create More Leaders. God did not, God created man to rule and everything about man is made with a desire to rule because it's absolutely knitted into the very foundational DNA because God is the ruler, the almighty God, the all-powerful God, the omnipotent, omnipresent, and he is the, 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 the father that is behind all leadership. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And that's the lover of our soul and the one that we follow. And the Holy Spirit comes to release everything that Jesus has for us into our heart. And that is why people desire leadership, because they were created by the leader of all creation. And they were created to lead. It says in Genesis 1 verse 27 to 28, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply in number, rule over all the fish, the birds, the living creatures that move. So friends, we were created to rule. And that word rule means to, it's rada, it's the word rada. And it means to have dominion, to dominate and to reign. But the problem is friends, we were never created to rule, dominate or reign over people. We were created to rule, dominate and reign over the earth and everything that moves on the earth. <clears throat> we were called and created to bring the earth into order. Unfortunately, with the fall of man that we see in Genesis 3, the curse that came upon Adam was that he would dominate his wife. But it was only dominating his wife. It wasn't dominating all of creation and every other person on earth. But when Jesus came and died on that cross, he broke every curse. He broke the curse of women. He broke the curse of men. He broke the curse that was established over Canaan. He broke the curses. He took the curse upon himself. And he broke every curse, friends. And we do not live under the curse anymore. And God has restored us back to our created state. And that is to have dominion and rule over this earth. This earth belongs to man. <clears throat> the enemy has stolen it from man. But this earth belongs to man. But friends, we were never ever created to rule each other. 
You see, godly leadership is not about rule and domination. It is about honor, respect, and submission to each other out of a love and a reverence for God. Ephesians 5 verse 21 says, Submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for our God. And so when we lead people, friends, we lead them because they submit to us. Why do they submit to us? Because they recognize something on your life they want to follow. It's not because you are dominating or controlling them, you leading them. And they choose to follow you out of submission because they recognize what you carry and they want what you carry. And so we see that God's order is so beautiful, so powerful, so liberating, so free, and it's never about force, domination, or control. <clears throat> to be an incredible leader, we have to lead as Jesus did, and not as the dictators, dominators, and manipulators of this world, who desire glory and use power and control to ro ro rule over people so that they can get that glory. Leadership is not about being powerful, but it's about empowering. We have to remember that God always gives leaders permission to care for his people. Friends, the sheep are his. The church is his. The people that God is training you up to lead one day with a servant, servant heart belongs to him. They will never be yours. They will never belong to you. You cannot own them. You cannot control them. And you cannot force them. You've got to have open hands that say, I want to empower you. I want to love you. I want to care for you because you are sacred treasure because you belong to the Father. He will not allow, uh, uh, we, they do not belong to the leader, but to God. And he will hold each and every one of us accountable one day for how we led his people, how we fed his people, and how he, we cared for his people. Now, Matthew 25 talks about the servant who's been given permission to look after the household of God. And it's a really important scripture for us to read and understand. And friends, we never, ever, ever, ever more than servants to our king. We become sons of God as well, but we become sons with a servant heart. And servants with the heart of a son. <clears throat> Matthew 25 verse 45 to 46 says this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his household to give the others their food at the right time? How blessed is that servant when the master finds, comes back finding him doing what he was left to do. But if that wicked servant says to himself, excuse me, <coughs> I do have an unfortunate cough at times, please forgive me. It's just an irritation at the back of my throat. But when that wicked servant says to himself, my master has been delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunks, that servant's master will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour that he doesn't know. Then his master will punish him severely and assign him to the place with the hypocrites. In that place, there is a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Friends, God's going to hold us accountable and responsible for the way that we look after his people. And it's really important that we never ever forget that. That we never forget that our hands need to be tender but firm when we're dealing with the sheep. Jesus taught us how to lead, and so he is the best example we could possibly have. And leadership, if leadership is organizing a group of people to reach a common goal, what was the goal that Jesus left for us? Well, number one, it was to restore, to restore mankind to have a personal, I'm so sorry, it was to restore mankind to have a personal relationship with God the Father. To be worshippers, it says in John 4, 23, that God is worshipping, is looking for worshippers that will worship him in spirit and truth. To be a holy people, 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says that we are a chosen generation, a holy people, a peculiar people. And God is looking for a chosen generation that will be a holy people. And he's looking for a people that he can lead into the fullness of a love and understanding of him, that he can wash us and cleanse us and transform us us so that we can look something like he does we would were to be priests and kings Re, um, revelations 1 
verse 6 and Revelations 5 verse 10. The goal is to establish worshippers, holy people, priests and kings, sons of God. Romans 8 verse 15 to 19. That's the goal. Jesus has come into this world to establish the kingdom of heaven and to gather a people that will be able to rule and reign with him in the kingdom of heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit want family, sons of God, to be part of their kingdom eternally, but that we will be on earth establishing his kingdom here so that more and more people can come into that incredible family called the children of God. He also came to destroy the works of the evil one. It says that in John 3 verse 8. And he came to lead people out of the kingdom of darkness into the wonderful kingdom of light. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 and Revelations um, 11 verse 15. And finally, to prepare the bride for the return of her bridegroom. Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 and Revelations 22 verse 6 to 11. So that is the goal, friends. It's organizing people for a common goal. That is the goal. That is why we do it. That is what we're doing it for. That is the aim of everything that we're ever going to do in leadership. How did Jesus lead? Well, Jesus was fully submitted to the Father, and he only did what he saw his Father do. You know, Jesus had a will of his own, but we know in Gethsemane he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And he laid down his life, he laid down his will, he laid down his, his visions and his passions so that he could fulfill the will of the Father in heaven. And that's the first thing we know about leadership, friends. We will always be asked to fulfill the will of the Father and then to help another person fulfill their destiny before God will trust us to be able to use us with what he's got for us. Leadership is an overflowing of the love of the Father. It is such a love for God. It is such a love for yourself where you are so comfortable with who you are, and it is such a love for people. It says in Mark 12, verse 30 and 31, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength, and then love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, friends, Jesus, the example of a good leader, led through love. You know, so many people want to be leaders. They want people to follow them. They want the glory and the power that they think leadership has. But they don't love the bride. They don't love the people. They don't even love God. And friends, if we're looking for that, we're looking for profile. We're not looking for people to empower other people through the absolute heartbeat of heaven, who God is looking for, people that know how to lead the way Jesus led. The second thing about the leadership of Jesus, he was a servant. He led with the heart of a servant. Jesus laid down his life so that we could live. As a leader, we don't lay down our lives to serve God. And then out of that, we serve people as God requires of us to. Friends, we're not there to jump to the bleating of the sheep. We're there to listen to God and then to pour out what God has got for people. Jesus would move from city to city, pouring out the Father's love into people's lives. But he would only do what the Father said he had to do. And there were times when he'd wake up in the morning and, and the disciples would say to him, there are crowds waiting for you. And Jesus would say, we're going in a different direction. Why? Was he rude at, for, toward those crowds? No. The Father had given him a different instruction and he was only going to do what he heard his Father say. It says in Mark 9 verse 35, If anyone desires to be first, the same shall be last and the servant of all. Friends, if you desire leadership, you've got to learn to be last. That means you don't eat until everybody's eaten. You don't go home until any, everybody's gone home. You don't leave the place until everybody's left the place. You don't look for the best until everybody else has. If you desire to be first, you've got to be the servant of all, and you've got to be prepared to go last. It says in um, Mark 10 verse 44, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. It says in Matthew 25 verse 21, faithful with little, I will make you ruler over much. And so God, Jesus' example to us, number one, to be an incredible person that is so passionately in love with God and so uncomfortable and in love with who they are. They're happy with their insecurities and their strengths. And the outflowing, the outpouring of that 
is that they love people incredibly. The third way that Jesus led was out of humility. Pride comes just before the four friends, but Jesus was humble. And humble does not mean you don't think anything of yourself. Humble means you think more of others. You spend more time thinking about others than you spend thinking about yourself. You know, you can be a very insecure person battling with rejection, but it doesn't make you humble. It just means you spend all your time thinking about you. And so what is a humble person? They spend more time thinking about others, thinking about God, than they do thinking about themselves. Jesus um, humbled himself and he came to earth as a man to come and live and to die so that he could be restored back to our Father and all of us could live in the privilege of sonship. He hung naked on a cross for us. You know, friends, have you ever thought about this? You know, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, right in the beginning of creation, when they, they sinned, they, they were walking, they were in a relationship with Elohim. Elohim is the multiple God, it's the plural God, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were covenanted and walking with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then when they sinned, that portal to heaven was shut for them. And there was a cherubim put there with a sword to make sure that they never went back in there again. And from that moment, friends, until Jesus came, the Holy Spirit retreated off the earth. The Father was in the heavenly realms. Jesus was in the heavenly realms. The, 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 the Elohim, the, the, the threefold Godhead, was in heaven. And there would be times that the, the Holy Spirit would come down on people. And there would be times that Jesus as the, would come and he would manifest with people. Like with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when they were in the flames of fire and God was with them. Jesus was with them there. And there would be times when the Father's presence would be among the people when they built the ark. And the presence would come into the ark. But except for times, moments, friends, there was no habitation on earth. And then we see that Jesus, the almighty, all-powerful, omnipresent, omnipotent God, the Son of God, came and he restricted himself, he humbled himself to come into the body of one man. Not only into the body of a man, into the womb of a woman as a seed. And he grew in the womb and he manifested as the boy and he grew into the man. Why did he do that? Why did he humble himself, friends? Because he wanted to show us what true leadership looked like. And you know, it always fascinates me that when Jesus went and got baptized and John said to him, no, 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 you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. But Jesus said, no, I have to, you have to baptize me. And when he went and got baptized, friends, it says that he walked out of there and the heavens opened. And the Father that Isaiah 66 talks about, render open the heavens again, render open the heavens and come down. That's what it had been like in Eden, friends, but it never been like that again. And in that moment, God rendered over the heavens and the Holy Spirit came down and Jesus was on the earth. And in that moment, the Trinity was back on earth. The Father spoke, the, the Spirit came down and Jesus was on earth. And not only that, friends, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the Holy Spirit came and lived in Jesus. And suddenly two thirds of the Godhead were on earth. The Holy Spirit in Jesus, on earth, in the form of a man, and the Father in heaven. And friends, Jesus did nothing unless he did it under the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. As a man, he was as limited as we are, because he chose that in humility. But when he was filled with the Spirit, he could do everything. He was completely empowered in the fullness of the seven spirits before the throne and the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And when he felt the Spirit, it said he would pray for people. They would be healed. There would be miracles. The, sick would be, the, sick, the dead would be raised. He operated under the Holy Spirit. And then, friends, Jesus said to the disciples in John 15, But it's good for, for me that I need to go, because when I go, the Spirit can come on you. And I'm paraphrasing. And then in Acts 2 verse 17, we see that it says that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Why could the spirit be poured out on humanity again, friends? Because Jesus came 
He broke open. He was filled with the Spirit. He contained the Holy Spirit. And the moment that he died, it said he breathed out. And he went into hell. And the first thing he did when he came back, when he came back to all the 12 disciples, it said he laid hands on them in John 20, and he breathed the Spirit into them. And the Spirit could now be available to them because Jesus had died and released the Spirit to fall on all of us again. How amazing is that, friends? How amazing is that? How powerful is the Holy Spirit? Jesus humbled himself, the third point, so that we could receive the Holy Spirit, so that we could live, so that we could be reunited with the Father. And he came in the, in the form of a human being, and he allowed them to completely crush him and, and destroy him and then kill him. He allowed that out of humility so that we could live. Friends, we've got to lead out of humility. We've got to get a revelation that I'm nothing. I'm absolutely nothing but for the power of the Spirit that lives within me. That's where the glory goes. The glory always goes to the Lord. So, um, worldly promotion will always lead to power, pride, and pre uh, uh, prestige. But the ways of the kingdom are very different. It's about submission to God and each other. It's about humility. It never, we never think more highly of ourselves. The Bible says, do not think of your, yourself more highly than you ought to in Romans 12. And it's about honor, giving honor where it's due. Not about taking honor for yourself and taking other people's ideas for yourself and making sure that all the glory goes to you, but giving honor where it's due. Matthew 18, 4 says, Whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Luke 14, 11 says, Anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the person who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus humbled himself to the very pit of hell, and he was exalted and given all authority to the highest, highest, highest levels. Proverbs 16, verse 18 said, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Proverbs 29, 21 says, A person's pride will bring about his downfall, but the humble in spirit will gain honor. Friends, it's incredibly important that we understand that everything about godly leadership is about humility. The fourth example that Jesus gave us was that a leader must live his or her life as an example for others to follow. We don't tell people to do one thing and we live in a different way. I love the, the, where Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. For leadership is I'm following Jesus. I'm doing what Jesus said. You follow me and all of us are following him. Um, in Titus 1 verse 3 to 5 it says, an elder must be blameless. And this is a leader's lifestyle, friends. An elder must be blameless. He must be the husband of one wife. Have children who believe and who are not accused of being wild, having a wild lifestyle or being rebellious. Because an overseer is God's servant manager. He must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or irritable. He must not drink too much. He must not be a violent person. He must not make money in a shameful way. Instead, he must be hospitable to strangers. He must appreciate what is good and be sensible. He must be honest, be moral and self-controlled. He must be devoted to the trustworthy message that agrees with what we teach so that he may be able to encourage others with a healthy doctrine and refute those who oppose it. There are two types of leaders that the Bible describes. The one is the overseer, bishop or elder, and that's a governmental leader. And the other is one, and that the elder, bishop or um, overseer establishes kingdom government. The government of the kingdom of heaven, that's what, they just, that, that, that's what they establish. And they bring those boundaries into the church so that people can learn and see and understand what a different lifestyle looks like. And then it talks about the deacons. And deacons are pastoral or nurturing leaders that care for the people. So the one brings in the order and the government of God and says, guys... This is what we are gathering toward. This is what we're aiming towards. This is what the word says. This is what the kingdom of heaven says. We hear this, this, the Holy Spirit who talks to the churches and we hear what God is wanting and we bring that into order. 
And then the deacons are the type of leaders that God appoints so that they can care and nurture for the people. Both of them can teach, both of them can preach, but they have very different roles in what they have to do for the kingdom. And if you um, look at 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 14, which I'm not going to look at right now, but I might get back to it in another week. We see the very clear description of the lifestyle that both of them are meant to lead as they serve the kingdom of heaven. God will never promote a person into leadership if they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Friends, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, God's not going to promote you into leadership. Man might, but God won't. Because everything about the word, Acts 6 verse 5, and every type of leader they ever chose, it had to be somebody that was full of the Holy Spirit. How can we lead a people to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? When the only part of the Godhead that is now on earth, Father and Son, God is seated, Jesus is seated with Christ in the heavenly places, and the only part of the Godhead that is now on earth that is helping us, our comforter, our guide, our advocate, our teacher, the one who's here all the time speaking into the hearts and minds of people. If you are not filled with him, friends, then all you're doing is teaching people religion. Because they are not connecting with the, with the, with the um, Trinity. They're connecting with you. So God will never raise a leader that is not spirit-filled. Man will, but God won't. He'll never raise a leader who has not learned to submit and honor another leader and another leadership style, even if that leadership style isn't what you think it should be. God always trains us by putting us under leaders that we are to submit to, that we are to empower, that we are to help so that we can be equipped to be able to do that for ourselves. He will not appoint a leader that has not walked the journey of being tried and tested, where God deals with our attitudes, our bad training patterns, and the developing of our character. And there's so many scriptures about that, but I'm going to just leave you with Matthew 4 verse 1. And Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 3. If we do not, if a person does not allow God to transform them by the renewing of their mind and change some of their programming and their neural parts and their reasoning, God will not use them. Friends, we come from very different cultures all over the world. But we have to lay down our culture, we have to lay down our thinking, our programming, our families. We've got to lay down everything of this world. So that we can understand and seek the kingdom of heaven. It says Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And everything else will be added unto you. Friends, if you're holding on to your culture, to your understanding, to your old rituals, to the old ways that you were trained. If you're holding on to any form of worship other than the worship of our Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. If you're holding on to myths to old wives' tales, or to cultural behavior patterns. God cannot use you. Because what are you going to lead people into? You're going to lead people into who you are. You're not going to lead them into who He is. And so I want to say to you today, friends, that at the end of this teaching, as you go home and you think about it, you need to say, Holy Spirit, show me what I'm holding on to that's not of you. And I want to tell you, friends, we all hold on to things. We hold on to cultural things. We hold on to hurts, we hold on to, to ways of behavior, we, we justify it, we think it's okay, but it's not okay. The Holy Spirit's not happy with that. And He's going to keep just stirring in our hearts, convicting us, highlighting things, showing us. He's such a gentleman, He never forces us until we are prepared to surrender. But the tragedy is, God will not promote a person into leadership that has not allowed Him to transform them from the ways of thinking. Man will, but God won't. Man will promote anyone for self-gain so that they can look like a better person or a better leader. A person who's got charisma or personality, they may have an incredible personality to attract people, but at home be a wife beater and be a drunkard. And they don't care about that. They just love the charisma that attracts people. So they'll promote them. You see, man will promote anybody because man looks at the person. God looks at the heart. And God will not promote anybody that hasn't got clean hands and a pure heart. And many people are in leadership positions today, friends, that are not God promoted. They're man promoted. They will promote somebody who, who, who has the potential of making money or bringing money in for them or giving them money. And they will promote people because they're friends. 
But when man promotes somebody, I want you to understand something. They cannot give you the grace. They cannot give you the anointing. They cannot release angels to help you. They cannot be there in times of trouble when only the Holy Spirit's assistance and angels' assistance in that time strengthen you. And the result is that when man has been promoted by man, they do not carry the anointing. And that is why they strive and they perform and they make everything look perfect by self-effort. And the end result of that is that they burn out friends. And usually because it's self-effort without anointing, they have to put all kinds of structure in place. They position themselves in a superior way. You can never get to them because they have separated themselves from the people because the people might see the truth that they're actually not coping. And the worst of all is that they give themselves a title. Friends, if you need a title for somebody to know that you're anointed, you're not anointed. An anointed person doesn't need a title to qualify them. Everywhere they are, wherever they go, anointing oozes out of them. And not a single person that carries anointing demands to be recognized for who they are. They want people to see Jesus in all that they do. So be careful. Be careful if you're striving because you've had man-made promotion. And now you've got to be separated and feel very important. And everybody's got to revere you. Because they can't revere the God in you or through you because he never promoted you. We resort back to worldly patterns and the ways of the enemy. And that is to control people through manipulation, making people feel guilty to get what you want out of them. Or domination, demanding things from them and, and, and then using scripture where it says you have to obey your leaders. Friends, when we resort to that, it's because we're trying to make something happen. That God isn't making happen. Because you see where God is, it's easy. There's an anointing. There's a flow. There is an absolute drawing of same spirits. People that are spiritful will recognize the spirit in you. It is, it's like honey, just drawing the bees to the honey pot. Because his word is like honey. He's an anointing. It's just the most incredibly beautiful thing. You don't have to try so hard and you don't have to force people. If you're doing that, you've got to relook at who you really are and what you're standing for. Submission is always a choice. Our submission is always to God first and then to those that he's put an authority over us that he asks us to submit to. And as I said before, we submit to somebody because we see what they carry. It is having a heart after God to fulfill his will on earth. Matthew 7 verse 21 says, um, not everyone who, who, who keeps saying, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he that does the will of our Father in heaven. Jesus laid down his will to submit to the Father's will, and we see that in Matthew 26 in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Holy Spirit lays down his will to submit to Jesus' will. Um, in John 14, verse 26, it says, The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have done. In John 15, 26, it says, when the helper comes, he will testify about me. Isn't that amazing? He didn't come to tell us all about him, but all about Jesus. John 16, 23 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will speak on his own. He will not speak on his own accord, but he'll speak whatever he hears and will declare to you the things that are yet to come. The father will never usurp the will of a person. But the enemy will always usurp a will of a person. And that is why, friends, submission is a choice of your will. It's not a demand from somebody that's forcing you to do something. It says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 15, See, I've set before you life and good, death and evil. God says, these are your choices you choose. He doesn't say, you better choose life because you know what's going to happen. He doesn't manipulate us. He doesn't control us. He doesn't dominate us. He says, you choose. And whatever we choose, when we go down the wrong road, he just waits until we cry out to him again. And then once again, he gives us a choice because he's a good, good father. And he wants to turn us back to good things for our life. But ultimately, it's always our choice. In John 10 verse 9 and 10, it says, The enemy comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life and life in abundance. You choose. Amazing, hey? Every time we make a choice, we choose either life or death. The enemy will always seduce us into things that appeal to the flesh, money, popularity, glory and power, 
to hook our hearts and then force us to get what he wants to violate our freedom of choice. Leaders with a heart after God will never use the ways of the enemy or the ways of this world to lead. We are called and anointed to set people free, not place them under another form of bondage called religion. We are called to set the people free. It is vital that leaders know how to empower others, friends. Leadership is about uh, uh, seeing the potential in somebody else and then guiding and teaching them to develop the potential that is within them. And so leadership is always about getting the best out of other people. Knowing the grace and the capacity of a person is vital for leadership. Now I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about grace and capacity. And then I think that might be the end because I've, I've got 45 minutes in this session. But um, I really just wanted you to understand there is such a difference between worldly leadership and godly leadership. There is such a difference between the heart of our father who's a good father and gives us choice and will never violate our will, who anoints us, appoints us, and everything about what he's got for us is easy. And the heart of man and the heart of the enemy that is dominating, forceful, destructive, strives, and always wants to elevate themselves to be important, instead of knowing that they are nothing, but God is the one that's all important. So when we look at the fact that there are different graces and different cap capabilities and different abilities with every single gifting, we realize that even though God may, might make many people leaders, not everybody has the same grace, the same capacity, the same ability, and the same anointing as others do and we must know that nobody is more important no one is superior no one's inferior they just have different grace skills and we have to understand that for ourselves and for other people it says in deuteronomy 1 verse 13 and 15 choose for yourself wise and discerning men known to the tribe and appoint them as your leaders so i chose leaders and appointed them over you commanders of thousands hundreds fifties and tens Friends, when God created us in our mother's womb, he put inside of us, number one, the calling that he had for us. And these callings are described in Romans 12, where he said that he made some to be leaders, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, some to be evangelists, some to be part, um, servants, servers, some to be merciful, and some to be givers. Those are the seven fundamental character gifts. Now God put that inside of us when he knitted us together in our mother's womb. We are born with a fundamental gifting of who we're ever going to be. An apple has apple seed inside of it. It never changes its seeds. And people want to try and be something that they were never created to be. We were created to be a particular type of person. And every one of those people have leadership skills because every one of those people were created to rule. And every one of them have the ability to lead, but they don't all have the same abilities. And so we've got to be very comfortable that some of us were created to lead thousands of people, some hundreds of people, some 50 people, and some 10. And if you were created to lead 10, then you've got the capacity, the grace, and the anointing for 10. And that is usually a person that's very pastoral. And so a person that is very pastoral has been anointed to deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. That's their greatest anointing. And so when they have up to about 10 people, they find it very comfortable to be able to deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. Now, when you put an expectation on them that is bigger than their capacity and their grace, they can't cope with it. So immediately they have to move into striving because it's not their happy place. And they have to make things happen because they don't have what it takes. And the result of that is that they burn out, they're miserable, they're unhappy, and they blame God. Now, exactly the same happens when you've got somebody that has a capacity for thousands. You put them into a tiny little group of 10. They are visionaries. They've been created to think big. They've been created to do big things for God. They are not anointed to deal on a one-on-one. -on -one. They are anointed to deal with crowds. Now you say to a big capacity thousand leader, I want you to look after that little home group of 10 people and I want you to pass to them, nurture them and care for them. They die. They don't carry the capacity and the anointing. They want to please you. They want to do what you're saying, but they are frizzling up and dying. And in both cases, people feel a failure. 
and they feel like they've let God down, God's let them down, and they want nothing more to do with it. Friends, purely because as a leader, you couldn't see the capacity and the grace that was on them. But as an individual, we need to teach people to find the capacity and the grace on them so that they can live in the fullness of what they were created to be. Um, it's, okay, leadership is a gift from God to the church and every gift comes with the grace of the gift. It says grace is, comes from the word and means charis. And it, this is what grace means. So if you've been called um, to be a leader of 10, you've got the grace for a leader of 10. If you've been called to, for a leader of 50s, you've got the grace for uh, to lead 50s and the same with thousands. And grace or charis, which is the, the Greek word, means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection through the life. The Holy Spirit within you has given you a gift that is operating in you and it overflows out of you. That's what grace is, friends. Grace means it is bubbling inside of you and all it does is it flow up. your cup overflows. It is easy. It just pours out of you. You don't even have to think about it. It just oozes out of you because it was knitted into you, then anointed under the Holy Spirit. It also means that which affords joy, pleasure, and delight. It makes you so excited. If you've got a grace for something, you will love it, friends. You will feel in the fullness of joy. You will be con completely contented doing what you've got grace for. It means a grace on your speech. It means kindness and favor, and it is a gift. So what do you get incredibly excited about? What is the thing that makes you delighted and excited and you're just overflowing? Because that's where you've got grace. And unfortunately, so many people have been positioned in the wrong place because we're doing this thing for God, but we have no clue how to be able to identify who people are, what they've been called to do, and how to bring them into the fullness. And so we find a whole lot of people striving, being driven, being exhausted, feeling guilty, and being called rebels because they can't do it, and they are feeling upset with the people that are forcing them. I want you to understand this. If you do not have the grace, you do not have the call. If it's not easy for you, it's not what God created you to do. If you do not have the grace, you do not have the call. Grace is a God-given ability. It makes the work easy. It is being yoked with Jesus. And you know, when you equally yoke, you just walk together and you're not carrying a load. You just, it's, it's, you're pulling together in the same direction and it is incredibly easy. And it is incredibly supporting because you know that as you're doing this, other people are being set free at the same time. Matthew 11 verse 29 to 30 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from, from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, everything that comes from our wonderful, incredible Father in heaven. That comes from the lover of our soul, our bridegroom Jesus. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. Is easy. It is easy easy and it operates out of rest and there's no effort at all when we do what God has called us to do. There's preparation, you, you have opposition because the enemy is never happy with you doing what he wants you to do but there's just such a delight and a joy when you're doing what you were created to do. It's like a piano sitting down at the piano and just playing out of sheer delight. It's like an artist that's just painting out of sheer delight in the same way it's leadership in the grace and the capacity that God has got for you. That is a sheer delight. Now there's a capacity to friends. You have to know what your capacity for people are. If you go beyond that, you will be burnt out. If you're operating with less than you need because you don't have the anointing for a one-on-one, -on -one, you will be burnt out. But when you are operating in your capacity and your grace, you will thrive. And friends, people that operate under grace and only ever stay within the grace that they've been given will never burn out. Jesus never burnt out. And he had the greatest ministry on earth. Why? Because he never went beyond the grace that he was given. We have to flow according to the grace that's been given to us. Romans 12 verse 6 says we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. And 1 Corinthians 1 verse 49 says... 
I will always thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way and in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because your testimony about Christ was confirmed in us. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day that our Lord Jesus Christ comes. God, who has called you into his fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, is faithful. Friends, don't go beyond your grace and know your capacity. Don't think because um, somebody else has got a bigger capacity than you that they're special. No, they're not. They've only been created to do that. And God's going to hold them accountable for their capacity. <coughs> Ephesians 4 verse 7 says, But unto every one of us grace is given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, in Matthew 25 verse 14 to 30, and I'd love you to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to quote a little bit. Again, it says this, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Exodus 18 verse 24 to 25 says, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all over Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Friends, we have to understand that when God gives us giftings, He will hold us accountable to the gifting and the capacity and the grace that He has given us. If we try and go beyond that, we're going to strive and that's not going to be God. When we do less than that, it will be disastrous because we will feel somehow that we are failing Him. But we have to understand that He is calling us now. When He calls us to a certain a level of capacity and grace. He does not test you at what you're using. If you've been called to have the capacity of the five talents or the thousand leaders, and he comes and finds you and you're only leading ten or you're only doing enough work to get by every day or you've only you've only invested one of the five talents, he's gonna come to you in the fullness of your calling and he's going to test you in the fullness of your calling. And he's going to put the weight on you for the fullness of your calling. Even if you don't want to be using the fullness of your calling. Because when God created your capacity and when he created who you are, he put inside of you everything you need. You know, it's like having an incredibly expensive car, a very fast sports car. And the car is capable of doing 200 miles an hour. And I get in the car. And I, I drive it, but I'm only going 30 k's an hour, 30 miles an hour. And God comes along and says, what are you doing, Kathy? Now get in the car and let me sit with you and go 200 uh, uh, kilometers an hour. Because that's the capacity of what it's meant to be going. And I'm saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. He says, no, that's the capacity. That's what we're going to test out. And he did exactly with Gideon. Yeah, Gideon was hiding in the wine press. He, he, was a, he was created to be a man of valor, a mighty, bold, courageous man. And here he's hiding in a wire press because of his own insecurities. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and he says, mighty man of valor. And he calls him out of there and immediately he puts him to task at the level of what he was created for and not at the level of his own faith. And we know the story he gathers 30,000 or however many people it was for war. And God says to him, no, there's too many and he says, I want you to let them drink. And those that just gulp the water, go home. And those that drink like this, you can keep them. And why did he say that? Because when you drink like this, you're alert, you're aware, you can see what's going on. When you're gulping the water, you're not aware of anybody else. And suddenly he had 300 men left. Now remember, he was found hiding in a press because he was too scared to go outside. Now he's got an army of 300. And God says to him, now go wipe out the enemy. That's amazing. How can he possibly do that? Because you see, friends, God does not test you, train you, and equip you according to what you want to use. He tests you, trains you, and equip you according to the capacity that he made within you. And we have to understand that no one can go into any level or form of leadership training and qualify as a leader until God has tested you. 
and God will allow the Holy Spirit to lead you into testing because he's going to test your character. He's going to test who you are. He's going to test how you do things. He's going to test whether you fall apart in a crisis or whether you've done all else to stand, you stand. God is going to test you. And Jesus himself, our example, before he could do anything for God, he came out of the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit led him into the desert for 40 days to be tested in every way by the enemy. And when he'd had the testing for 40 days, the enemy left him and God released angels to minister to him. And he said, now you're ready to do what I've called you to do. Friends, that's the end of session one. Next week, I'm going to be looking at uh, two different leadership styles, um, if I get to both of them. But I really hope that you've enjoyed this. My message today is this. We've got to lead like Jesus led. We cannot lead in the style of the world. We cannot be impressed with the style of the world. And we cannot use the, the tools of the enemy, manipulation, control, domination, power, and glory going to man to do what God has called us to do. God bless you, and until we meet again, goodbye.